In the last 25 years, ghost hunting has entered something of a golden age, with all sorts of technology playing its part and filling up an investigator's kit bag. Cameras, EF meters, infrared thermometers and spirit boxes all help to carve a science out of a difficult premise, with differing levels of credibility. In the early 1800s, things were a little bit different. It was a simpler time. All you needed back then was a stiff drink, or maybe two, and a loaded revolver. Because, as we all know, if you want to catch a ghost, you need to shoot it first. This is all well and good, provided the ghost that you shoot isn't just a man in his work overalls. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome back to Dark Histories. I'm Ben, your host as always, and this is Season 8, Episode 11. I don't believe I have much in the way of news today, so we're going to jump straight into it. This episode is one that I read about a long, 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 long time ago, uh, back when I did Yesterday Today, if anyone remembers that. Um, and uh, I, I remember coming across the story and thinking, I'm not sure that's enough for a full episode. And uh, looking into it a little bit more, I decided we'll give it a go. So yeah, today's episode is a little bit shorter than the others, but it's uh, I think it's all there. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoy it. This is called a shot in the dark, the Hammersmith Ghost of 1804. The Victorian era is often seen as a period of great supernatural belief, a world of gothic literature, ghost stories, spiritualism, mesmerism, psychical investigations, mind-bending scientific discoveries and religious experimentation that might consider it as a paranormal or superstitious golden age. This viewpoint of the age can make it hard to reconcile that, just decades earlier, the world was in a much more sceptical place. The Age of Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th centuries had paved the way for a widespread adoption of the philosophical ideals of rationalism and empiricism that seemed so far away from a world that would embrace people like the Fox sisters. Superstition and belief in the supernatural had gradually become seen more and more frequently as fodder for the uneducated, with books, pamphlets and journals commonly referring to the new age of a more rational thought. Despite this, there seemed to exist a somewhat contradictory fact that, amongst the educated classes, the existence of ghosts was still being debated throughout the Gentlemen's Clubs of London right up until the 1790s. Ghosts, witchcraft and magic were conversely both a matter long since dealt with by the Enlightenment and a maintaining source of great intrigue, entertainment and, for some, even fear long after such matters were supposed to have been solved. The affair of the Cock Lane Ghost of 1762 is just one example of how the supernatural, so easily shrugged off in literary publications, thrilled a swarm of Londoners across all classes as crowds of people gathered to experience the mysterious wrappings on the walls of a young girl's bedroom. All the while, learned gentlemen and clergymen gathered together to mull over their meanings. In 1736, the UK government repealed the witchcraft laws, amending the word in to apply to those who only claimed to be able to use magical powers. And yet, still in the first quarter of the 19th century, vigilante groups across the country were fighting against suspected witches, which led to some magistrates having to bend the law in order to convict those brought in by the groups. In short, there appeared to be a transitional period of sorts, whereby an outward pretense of respectability aimed to decry the dark ages of superstition, whilst the lingering traditions and beliefs proved a little more difficult to exercise from almost all levels of popular society. Despite all claims to the contrary, the belief, or at least the fear, of ghosts, magic and witchcraft was still alive and well at the dawn of the 19th century, and in 1804, a legal case would test just how far the limits of that belief would go. In 1804, Hammersmith, in West London, was a parish of around 45,000 souls. Situated on the north bank of the River Thames and bordered by Kensington in the east and Fulham to the south, it was a far cry of the district today, with acres of arable fields and residential market gardens intersected by the main high road which led traders and travellers to the west of the country. It was a stomping ground for the Roman Catholic community and was home to an old Gothic nunnery that sat just a stone's throw from an old convent a college for the priesthood, and a collection of chapels and churches. The main town of Hammersmith, extending from the high road, 
consisted of a collection of streets filled with local businesses and inns, all intertwined by a spider's web of narrow lanes, crisscrossing and joining one street to another. It was here, in these dark and narrow back alleys, that a ghostly spectre appeared to make his home in the winter of 1803, terrifying residents for several months, leading to a general feeling of panic and fear until, one night in early January, an enthusiastic ghost hunter loaded his pistol and took it upon himself to seek out the spectre for himself. The final weeks of 1803 ushered in a welcome end to what had been a relatively dramatic year for Londoners. The country had declared war on France that spring, queuing up Napoleon Bonaparte as everyone's favourite upcoming pantomime villain and focusing the public's thoughts on a grim cloud that hung over the continent. London, in particular, was entering a period of rapid expansion, which added to the feeling of uneasiness amongst many. Daily, the papers were filled with news on militia movements as the courts of Europe manoeuvred and schemed. In Hammersmith, London, there was something new and far more urgent to fear. Sometime in November, rumours of a ghostly spectre sweeping through the streets and churchyards of the district had been steadily growing, as more and more people were sighting an otherworldly visitor that didn't seem to take too kindly to its human witnesses. As the rumours grew, so too did the coverage, which was eventually picked up by newspapers right across the capital. The first dated sighting of something unnatural creeping around Hammersmith was around 10pm on the night of the 15th of December 1803, when Thomas Groom, a servant to a local brewer, had an unfortunate and unusually physical altercation with a ghost as he was passing through the churchyard of St Paul's with a friend. Something lurched out in the darkness and grabbed him by the throat. I was going through the churchyard between 8 and 9 o'clock with my jacket under my arm and my hands in my pocket when some person came from behind a tombstone which there are four square in the yard behind me and caught me fast by the throat with both hands and held me fast. My fellow servant, who was going on before, hearing me scuffling, asked what was the matter. Then, whatever it was, gave me a twist round and I saw nothing. I gave a bit of a push out with my fist and felt something soft like a great coat. The two men reeled backwards together, but were unable to see anyone or anything that could have caused any disturbance. In a later report, the experience was embellished so that the creature that grabbed his neck was described as dressed in the hide of a calf with cloven feet and enormously large horns. This was a visage that was apparently scary enough to send Thomas Groom into a state of shock, leaving him bedridden for several days. The description might sound awfully sensational, but it was really nothing since, apparently, the spectre liked to shapeshift, and in later sightings it was described sometimes like a human-sized figure covered in a white sheet, and at other times a cowskin. Sometimes it had horns on its head, and had glass eyes or eyes like a glowworm, and yet to other people it appeared as a vision of Napoleon Bonaparte, or like a horse with no head. In some of the more extreme descriptions, it was seen breathing fire and smoke and sinking into the ground, vanishing in a moment. Whatever the rumours were of how it looked, the fear around Hammersmith was truly quite palpable, and it was deemed prudent by many people to stay home after 5pm, as soon as the sun had fallen beneath the horizon and the early winter night had crept over the town. About a week after the incident in the churchyard with Thomas Groom, a terrified coachman came running into town in a dumb panic, screaming about having seen a ghost out on his route. He had heard a strange rustling sound as he turned down a narrow lane and then saw, by the faint light of the moon, a creature dressed all in white gliding across the neighbouring field. When it neared the coachman's carriage, he leapt down and left the coach and horses where they stood, only returning after he had made a ruckus in town and convinced a dozen of the local men to return with him. When the men came across his coach, Abandoned as he had left it, they found the horses grazing in the nearby field, their reins having been cut. Two more relatively similar stories happened just days later, when a team of horses that were apparently frightened by the ghosts bolted, tearing away with the wagon still attached, dragging the vehicle some distance before coming to a stop on their own volition, some miles down the road. A second story told of a wagoner who saw the ghost and, just like the first, had leapt from his carriage, leaving everything behind, 
including his eight horses and 16 passengers. Rumours flew as to who the culprit was, with some convinced that it was the ghost of an unnamed Hammersmith man who had cut his own throat a year previous, whilst others believed it to be a local madwoman who was known to have walked through the churchyard dressed in strange and uncouth dresses. It seemed almost everyone around Hammersmith had their own version of what the ghost looked like and their own sighting to tell others about. The levels of hysteria around the situation were growing so rapidly that people were seeing ghosts in entirely usual situations, just like the story told by a local chimney sweep who had been walking through Church Lane when he saw a figure dressed all in white floating by the base of a tree. Snatching up a stick from the ground and edging slowly towards the figure with his stick extended, he let out a nervous greeting. Ghost, or whatever you may be, pray be civil. Since no reply was forthcoming, the sweep continued his steady forward approach until his stick met with a very physical torso, which turned out to belong to a local young man and woman who had been frolicking in the dark. By Christmas, things did begin to calm down in Hammersmith, though a few weeks later, sightings began to creep out of the labyrinth of tight lanes in the south of the district, specifically focusing around Black Lion Lane, where several reports surfaced. On Thursday the 29th of December, things got all the more strange when William Girdler, a night watchman, was approached by a young apprentice shoemaker as he stepped out of a house adjoining Beaver Lane, who was looking dreadfully frightened and yelling at him that he had just seen the ghost. Once the initial shock of the situation had faded, Girdler looked across the lane in time to see a figure wearing what he described as a white sheet or tablecloth beginning to run away, pulling the sheet over his head, bundling it up under his coat and escaping into the narrow lanes. That night, several more people thought they saw a similarly described character dressed in a sheet in the same spot, whilst another saw someone hiding behind someone's house and then gingerly stepping out and walking off, a corner of a white sheet showing under the bottom of their coat. Somewhere along the line, the ghost was beginning to look more and more human. Regardless, its presence still managed to maintain its grip on the town, and when a pregnant woman came across the ghost one night, rising from the tombstones as she passed through the churchyard, she turned to run, and the ghost caught up with her and pressed in on her arms, which caused her to faint on the spot. This sighting reportedly terrified her so much that it was later rumoured that she actually died after several days of being bedridden from fright. The fact that she was never named meant that there's really no way to verify if this was anything more than a rumour, but whether or not she really did die, it seemed that she had never actually seen a ghost anyway, as it was later reported that she had instead happened across a rowdy drunk on his way home from the pub. How she misinterpreted that as a ghost rising from the tombstones is anyone's guess. Miss sightings like this continued to plague the Hammersmith public, and on the night of the Saturday, 31st of December, on New Year's Eve, a gentleman riding in a carriage with two lady friends thought that they too had seen the by now locally infamous ghost, though this time it turned out to be nothing more than a local bricklayer named Thomas Smith, who had been dressed in the traditional white linen and flannel garb of a tradesman. In response to being called a ghost, Smith asked the gentleman if he would like a punch in the head which presumably straightened the situation out. With so much panic, it wasn't long before a local clergyman alongside a local businessman chipped in together to offer an informal reward of 10 guineas to whoever could find out who the perpetrator was, which only added to the excitement and spurring on of the low-key vigilante groups that had taken it upon themselves to hunt the ghost, all of which had so far come up with no answers to the mystery whatsoever. By January, the ghost panic around Hammersmith had been growing for almost two months. The turn of the year had done little to quell the interest around Hammersmith, nor the strange sightings. Small groups of ghost hunters had taken to the streets at night, but there had been no organised effort by any night watchmen, nor any of the parish officials. On the night of Tuesday, January 3rd, Francis Smith, a 29-year-old exciseman working to collect tax on the local produce and goods, had been drinking in the pub next to his lodging house, called the White Hart. He had been with the local night watchman, William Girdler, when the two decided, perhaps with no small amount of Dutch courage, and perhaps spurred on by Girdler's own experience with a very suspect ghost several weeks earlier, to take it upon themselves to hunt the spectre. Loading their pistols with ball and powder, 
they stepped out into the cold, dark streets and headed off towards the narrow, winding lanes that made their way south towards the Thames. It was around 10.30pm when Francis and William parted ways, with Girdler getting back to his normal rounds, and Francis heading over to Beaver Lane, where reports of the ghost had been most prevalent. Girdler agreed to rejoin him once his patrols had finished and that he had called the hour, and the two came up with an uncomplicated signal for their meeting, with the first saying out loud, Who goes there? To which the second would reply, A friend. With the practicalities out the way, Girdler carried on his way, leaving Francis in darkness, alone with his loaded gun. The lanes were especially dark on what was already a dark night. Less than four feet wide and lined with tall hedges, Thomas stepped into a tight lane that linked Beaver with Black Lion Lane when he saw a figure step into the lane ahead of him, dressed from head to foot in white. Damn you! Who are you? What are you? Speak or I'll shoot! He yelled into the dark, and hearing no reply, he edged forward. Then, deciding against caution, he squeezed the trigger of his pistol, which exploded with a deafening crack and a blinding flash. The figure slumped to the ground as Francis reeled back up the lane, heading back towards the pub. Following the gunshot, Francis barreled away back up the road and entered the White Hart Inn, where he came across Girdler making his rounds with a quiet drink. Frightened, Francis stammered over his words, barely able to speak, but did eventually manage to convey the fact that he had shot the ghost. In a startling example of how ghosts were imagined in the early 19th century by the average Londoner, Girdler asked Thomas if he had hurt it. Thomas, unable to give him a sure answer, suggested he feared he had very bad. The two men left the pub to go back to the site of the shooting, and on the corner of Black Lion Lane, they bumped into a man from Francis' neighbourhood, a Hammersmith wine merchant named Mr John Locke, who had been returning home from drinking in the Plough and Harrow alongside his friend Mr Stowe. After calling the two men to one side of the road, Francis stammered out a confused confession that he had killed a man who he believed to have been the ghost. Locke and Stowe agreed to divert their return and go with them to the site of the shooting, and all four men made their way back to Cross Lane. When they arrived, they found the ghost lying on the ground, just as Francis had described. Well, almost as Francis had described. Far from a ghost, the body on the ground was that of a man wearing white trousers, a white flannel waistcoat and apron, with a single bullet wound on the lower left side of his jaw. The blood on his face contrasted starkly with his crisp, recently new tradesman's dress. He lay still and was apparently quite dead. Figuring it best not to leave him in the street, the four men decided to send for the High Constable before carrying the body south down Black Lion Lane to the nearby Black Lion pub. Whether it was shock or Francis still somehow believed that he had shot an actual spectral being, he didn't seem at all concerned for his own future, convinced that he'd done nothing wrong in shooting the ghost. This was at least until Mr Locke suggested that he may well be in a considerable deal of trouble, whereby his initial reaction wore off and he was instead replaced by a deal of panic. Paired with the identification of the body as 22-year-old local tradesman Thomas Millwood, things seemed to begin travelling at an exceptional rate for Francis. Figuring it best to settle him down, Mr Locke sent Francis home to get some rest. Later that evening, when Francis was called back to the Black Lion, It appeared that he had managed to calm down some, his panic replaced entirely with despair as he had come to the conclusion that his best course of action would be to turn himself in to the nearest parish official, which he did later that evening. Things moved fairly quickly following the shooting, with the inquest taking place the very next day, on Thursday the 4th of January at the Black Lion Inn in front of the coroner, Mr Hodgson, who had that morning ordered Dr Flower to inspect the body. As witnesses gave their testimonies, the full account of what had happened slowly began to make itself clear. Thomas Millwood had been talking with his sister, Anne, in front of the fire at his father's house just before 11pm on the night of the shooting. When they heard the watchman's cry for the hour, Anne told Thomas to go and fetch his wife from work, as she was concerned on account of how dark it was outside that night. The moon had been reaching its last quarter, and the weather had been a cold, cloudy start to the year. With little street lighting, the gloom of January had turned to a thick blackness by early evening once the sun had inched below the horizon. Begrudgingly, Thomas hauled himself up and, leaving the warmth of the fire behind, went to meet his wife, 
but returned alone shortly after, saying that his wife had turned him away and that she would finish work after another 30 minutes. Just as he had settled himself back down in front of the flames, his sister was back on his case again, telling him that his 30 minutes was up and that he should really go and meet his wife once more. Thomas stepped up from the fire and out into the cold dark streets of Hammersmith. He'd only made it some 50 yards before Francis Smith approached him, brandishing his pistol and shouting threats into the night air. Having watched her brother out the door, Anne had seen the flash of the gun and heard the shot fire out. She called out to her brother, but hearing no reply, rushed back into the house to wake up her mother and father, telling them that she thought that Thomas had been shot. Thinking their daughter's story was ridiculous, they refused to get out of bed, turning her away and telling her that it was impossible. She tried instead to rouse the lodger sleeping in the next room, but he too was less than keen to step out into the bitter cold, simply on the account of what he believed was just a hysterical woman. Given up on any help, she stepped out into the streets herself, making her way to where she had seen the flash of the gun, and there, on the street, she found Thomas lying on his back, his face covered in blood. During her emotional testimony, Anne swore that Thomas had never impersonated the ghost intentionally, though she relayed the story of how he had apparently been less fatally mistaken for a ghost once before, until at least he'd threatened to punch the man in the head. Following Anne's testimony, the medical evidence was breezed over on account of the absence of the surgeon, Dr Flower, though it was decided that it was largely relevant anyway, given the fact that the gunshot wound had broken the jaw and bruised the face, leaving it covered with powder burn and was, without doubt, the cause of death. The bullet, a small number four ball, had penetrated the vertebrae of the neck and injured the spinal marrow. There didn't seem to be any other wounds on the body at all, which had led Flower to conclude that the cause of death was from the bullet wound, which he had no doubt would have been fatal. A newspaper described the wound as having perforated every part of the head. With these brief testimonies out of the way, the coroner summarised the case for the jury in what is probably one of the more bizarre speeches in English legal history, lamenting at great length as to the situation at hand and the disappointment he felt that such an inquiry was even necessary in an enlightened age. He regretted that, in this enlightened age, the fatal event which had convened them should have exhibited such a proof of the superstition of the uninformed part of this community. He had hoped the lights of reason and philosophy would have precluded the possibility of such an inquiry. But as the experience of the present instance shewed that the prejudices and prepossessions of ignorance still prevailed, it was necessary to have it definitely understood that no idea of a ghost justified any person to arm himself with a weapon of death, for the purpose of destroying the supposed apparition. The jury, having listened to this speech, gave an immediate verdict of willful murder against Francis Smith, who was swiftly removed from the courtroom and placed in Newgate Prison, where he was to await a full murder trial at the Old Bailey. Francis did not have particularly long to wait for his trial, with the assizes getting underway the following week. His own trial began on the morning of Friday the 13th of January at the Old Bailey. For the most part, the trial played out as a replay of the inquest, with a few additions, not least a statement made by Francis himself. Events kicked off with John Locke giving his experience of the night, relaying the story of how he had met Francis following the shooting. When asked about the Hammersmith ghost, he said that he had heard of stories of the ghost for several weeks, but he had not seen it himself. When questioned about the scene, he agreed that the lane was very dark on account of it being enclosed in hedges and that Thomas's appearance had looked much like the rumoured ghost. Finally, he assured the judge that Francis was a man with a mild disposition that was generally liked. Girdler was up next to the stand and much like Locke, he repeated a similar testimony to the one given at the inquest where he walked through the events of the night and of his own experience seeing the ghost the week before. Anne Millwood gave her testimony next filling in the court with the details that led Thomas to leave the house to collect his wife from work, prior to being shot, and of how she had seen the flash of the gun and heard the shot, prompting her to go out and to discover her brother's body. Dr Flower turned up this time and gave his brief medical evidence, where he confirmed that the gunshot had been both the only wound on the body and the wound that had killed him. Finally, it came to Francis to offer up a few words, though his explanation fell fairly well short of any solid defence. My lord, 
I went out with a good intention, and when this unhappy affair took place, I did not know what I did. Speaking to the deceased twice and he not answering, I was so much agitated, I did not know what I did. I solemnly declare my innocence, and that I had no intention to take away the life of the unfortunate deceased, or any other man whatever. One lesser detail of the trial, though undoubtedly Francis would have been relying on it heavily at the time, was that almost every witness was complimentary in regards to his character, calling him a good-tempered young man or mild and a man of humanity. This was all before the defence called on his own twelve witnesses who were each tasked with painting Francis as a man of exceptional character that had never caused any trouble prior to the shooting. Unfortunately, the character testimonies failed to hold much sway, as the judge dismissed most of them in his summary, given the fact that Francis would have been fairly transient due to the nature of his excise work, and therefore would not have known any of the locals for any significantly long periods of time. Following the relatively brief proceedings, the jury stepped out for 45 minutes to consider their options, before returning a verdict to the judge of guilty for the charge of manslaughter. The judge was forced to reject this verdict on account that the jury were to deliberate and deliver on the charge of murder, a charge which was unable to be reduced. He gave them two options, to deliver up the verdict of guilty of murder or a total acquittal from want of evidence. Forced to make a decision, the jury found Francis guilty of murder and the judge passed a sentence of death, Francis' execution to take place the following Monday with his body to be handed over for dissection after the fact. Despite the verdict, however, Francis' trial presented an awkward situation for the court. Was he truly guilty of murder if the target of his shot was not believed to have been alive in the first place? The judge attempted to make it clear in his summary all killing amounts to murder, unless a legal excuse can be assigned such as I have before described, namely self-defence or violence from sudden provocation, which latter case is considered manslaughter. But here, the unfortunate man at the bar goes out with a loaded gun in his hand, considering himself entitled to shoot the individual who had alarmed the credulity of his neighbours, and fires with a rashness the law will not excuse. What might have been the motive the inducement or the mind of the prisoner when he resolved to perpetrate so malicious a design was not the subject of the present inquiry, though it might hereafter be matter for higher consideration. The judge went on to liken the situation to a person shooting a highway robber in self-defence that might later turn out to have been an innocent passerby. In such a case, the outcome would have been murder regardless, and so he affirmed it should be the same whether or not Francis believed he was shooting a ghost or a living, breathing person. Unfortunately, not everyone seemed to agree, and the higher consideration that the judge mentioned was absolutely called into play when the matter was pushed up the chain and presented to the king that evening, who granted Francis respite until a full pardon was delivered 12 days later on the 25th of January, on the single condition that he should spend a year in prison instead. Whilst all of this had been going on, some fairly interesting developments had been taking place in the background, which many newspapers were happy to conclude wrapped up the whole affair neatly. Around the time of the inquest, on the day after the shooting, one of the residents of Hammersmith had taken it upon themselves to inform the officials that one of their neighbours had been dressing up in a white blanket and going out at night with the sole intention of scaring people in the streets. John Graham was a shoemaker living in the back of his shop in Dorville's Row near to the supposed haunted lanes. Graham was promptly brought up in front of the magistrate where he admitted to dressing up like a ghost, explaining that his apprentice had been in the habit of scaring his three children by telling them ghost stories and scratching on the walls of their house at night, hoping to scare them. Graham devised the idea of dressing up like a ghost in order to spring out on the apprentice one night after purposely sending him out to walk a servant girl home in order to terrify him and gain an order of revenge. Having been recommended to the magistrate as being a man of good character and a principal singer at church, which he attended regularly, Graham was bailed and sent home, feeling somewhat sheepish. At least as far as the press were concerned, the matter was now solved. But just how many of the scares over the last few months had truly been meted out by Graham? Especially since he told the magistrate that he had only dressed up like a ghost once in order to scare his apprentice. 
Some papers suggested that as punishment, he should be made to seek out the real culprit who had scared so many people, but it appears he managed to escape such a suggestion. This was a pretty fortunate outcome for Graham, as it seems very likely that there have been several ghost impersonators, as well as several missed sightings, which could easily have been attributed to the hysteria caused by rumour and press sensationalism. As it turned out, there had already been a suspect that had come to the fore several weeks earlier, though it had caused far less press interest at the time, likely since it had taken place before the shooting of Thomas Millwood. A young servant boy working for a butcher named Mr Kilburton had been discovered creeping about in a churchyard in mid-December, and when he was discovered, much like Graham, he explained that he was there in order to scare one of the maids from his household. In an added twist, it was a prank that he apparently thought might be more successful if he dressed up in the maid's own clothes. Whether or not the boy had decided on pulling the stunt before the rumours of ghosts, or he was just one of the many confused sightings, or even if his prank had been the genesis of the rumours in the first place, nothing was ever truly established, though the fact that ghostly visitations seem to continue after the young servant's discovery appears to point towards the former. Following the trial, and with all the evidence of the ghost being little more than a string of pranksters looking to cause or contribute to a local panic, the literary classes quickly jumped to make their judgments on the working class folk from Hammersmith who had fallen for such ridiculous superstition. All the while, profiting from the situation and debating, in an enlightened way, naturally, on the existence of ghosts. In what seems a lot like a contradictory attitude, many write-ups of the story were quick to point out that the whole affair had been quite out of place in an enlightened age, despite the fact that superstition was evidently still rife throughout a large cross-section of society, whether the age was considered enlightened or not. Whatever it was that had been stalking the streets of Hammersmith, it appeared to dissipate following the trial of Francis Smith, and the parish eventually fell back to a peaceful choir, with no more ghosts or pranksters to speak of. As bizarre as the story of the Hammersmith ghost might sound, it is far from the only story in history of a person being shot after impersonating or being mistaken for a ghost. In 1866, a man was shot dead by a young girl in a cemetery in Boston after he wrapped himself in a white sheet and attempted to scare a group of young girls. Most of the girls ran away when they saw the ghost, but one pulled a gun and shot the man twice in the head and four times in the torso. In 1906, a farmer shot at a white lady who had been pressing her face to the farmhouse windows late at night and then subsequently disappeared. After the third night of terrifying the residents, one of them opened fire with a shotgun, though in that case an added twist spices up the story a little given the fact that no body was ever found. In 1937, a man shot his friend dead in a cemetery in Yugoslavia after he had attempted to sneak into the place and remove a wreath for a drunken bet that he had made in a nearby pub. One of his friends, thinking it would be an amusing prank, jumped out at him from behind a tombstone, startling the first enough to cause him to shoot him dead with his revolver. In that case, the shooter was not charged with murder, but still found himself in prison for violating the peace of the cemetery. Fortunately, the stories run dry in later years, suggesting that possibly people might have become wise to the idea that dressing up as a ghost and stalking through cemeteries at night might not be the best idea, especially when the population might be armed. The story of the Hammersmith ghost remains unique in the sense that the shooter stood trial for murder was convicted and then eventually pardoned. But it's also unique in the depth of its documentation. One thing that makes it difficult to understand is where the story came from in the first place. It seems fairly clear that there were many pranksters in Hammersmith that winter. But what, if anything, had started the panic in the first place? Had it all really been pranksters? And were the descriptions of cloven-hoofed, fire-breathing monsters just rumour and press sensationalism? Or did they have their origins in something altogether more terrifying? In the Age of Enlightenment, were the streets of Hammersmith plagued by something entirely explainable? Or like many of the people still seem to believe, was there something much more unexplainable stalking through the dark lanes, waiting to grip by the throat those that no longer believed? So that was the Hammersmith Ghost Shooting of 1804, 
and we'll be back to talk a little bit about this episode after these short advert breaks. Welcome back. So yeah, the Hammersmith Ghost of 1804, it's a really interesting story. I say it's one I found when I was doing Yesterday Today, way back. I don't remember how many years ago when I used to do that. But um, it's, but it had stuck with me. Just, um, I think it was, a, I, I found it curious um, for a couple of reasons. But, but mostly, I think the thing that I found most interesting um, was the era in general, uh, just being the fact that, you know, Everyone uh, wrote about the era as this uh, enlightened and uh, rational uh, time, you know, where where people had shrugged off sort of superstition. But clearly, that's just not true. And when you actually look at it, like the the population still believed, and right up through to like the early twentieth century, people. I mean, even as far as I would say, probably the Second World War, ghosts and witchcraft and things like that were still. Uh, remarkably well believed by the population if you like you know I, so i find this contradiction between what the literary art- articles were saying and what the people were doing to be really interesting um i, I don't know why i found that interesting i just i just found it really interesting i, re- I read a, a study and um, like a th- someone wrote a thesis about this actual idea but it was it was they wrote something, the thesis was actually about something else, but they sort of touched on this subject. I, I found it really interesting. I, I love to, you know, read a proper thesis about this because I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting time. The contrast between it, the, the pretense, if you like, and what was actually happening, it, it's fascinating. I, I, I think it's a really interesting period, and I, I'd be really interested to know why they were writing this. You know, it was almost like they were trying to talk themselves into the the idea uh you know because even the educated people you you could say the obvious answer is that the educated people you know were enlightened and the you know silly working class divs that you know (laughs) didn't read were still sort of behind the times or something like that you know that would be the obvious example but or the obvious answer rather but but it wasn't true like even educated people were debating the existence of ghosts uh for for decades and centuries after you know this supposed enlightenment um so I find that really interesting, you know, like 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 the um, the the relationship between the Enlightenment and uh, I guess like the psychical uh, and superstition. Um, I, I I found that really interesting. I think it really it shows itself in this case um, purely for the fact that you know all of the newspapers uh, they write about it quite snidey and quite snarkily. Um, you know, later on, once they found out that you know the ghost was that was shot was actually a man. They, they write about the story, um, you know, very tongue in cheek and with this kind of, uh, you know, oh, we all knew it was, you know, a human all along. But that clearly isn't the reality of what was going on on the ground. You know, in Hammersmith, clearly there was a, a panic, you know, there was a, a hysteria um, going on. So, um, you know, and that it doesn't reflect what was being said. Uh, and I just I just found that really, really interesting. Unfortunately, the story itself is is quite hard to track its genesis um, because it, it didn't really get picked up by the newspapers until uh, for for a good month, really, and 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 before that, it, it only really existed as an oral story, an oral phenomena, I guess. Um, so by the time it had reached the papers, it was already a sort of fully formed like legend almost, um, and so trying to trace the origin of the ghost is, is really hard. Um, I, 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 I enjoy doing that um, with Dark Histories where you work your way back slowly uh, through reports and writings about such things and uh, you, know, you, you can slowly sort of almost create like a, a family tree or, or, or like a, you, you can see the transitions from one thing to the next. Like in this case, for example, uh, it's quite mixed up by the time it hits the papers because you don't get the natural transition between it changing from uh, a horse with no head and a cloven hoof fire breathing monster to a human uh, in a white sheet. And instead you sort of get this mashup between all of it. So it's quite hard to say to work out the genesis because that for me is really interesting in this case. Um, you know, where did it come from? Because it had to have come from somewhere. So were the original ghost stories a prankster or were the original ghost stories uh, a, a, 
an actual, you know, uh, quote unquote, real ghost sighting, um, you know, whether or not that was mistaken or or real, depending on how you want to, you know, how sceptical you want to be about that. You know, were they based on something true? Uh, you could say quote unquote true. If you, you know, I mean, not a prankster, it, you know, if it was something that was a mistaken or a true ghost sighting, you know, uh, however that might have come about. I, I guess what I'm trying to say this is a bit confused. Was it that or was it a prankster from the start? And then that's really hard to um, sort of uh, work out with this case because they, they, I think the documentation behind it just doesn't have enough evolution. Um, it, it's, to say, it's fully formed by the time it hits the papers. And so it's a bit of a mess right from the start, which is a shame. I think the, the one thing you can say is that the the slightly earlier stories, because all the stories are really baked into like one or two weeks of newspaper footage uh, of newspaper coverage and I, I think you can say that the very earliest stories they did seem to be slightly less skeptical or or have less like sort of snarky snidey sort of language in them they they talk about how people were keeping themselves locked in after five, well I, I i came up with it must have been about 5 p.m because that was when the sun was setting back then uh in january um because that's when you know the set the sun sets in January. Um, but you know people were giving themselves keeping themselves off the streets at night, and uh, you know there was clearly hysteria happening. So there was a, a clear belief in the ghost, at least on the ground originally. Um, and and the newspapers seemed to at least follow that in the early days. Um, but that's about all you can really see in terms of sort of uh, evolution um which is a shame say because because I, I because i would love to find the the, the very original like where this story actually you know where its genesis actually was that must have been one of those sightings but but which is, is anyone's guess um i think one really interesting point uh in the transcripts is that gerda says he didn't really care when he heard the gun go off because uh, as a night watchman, he heard them go off every night, every 15 minutes, which is madness. Because, I, I, yeah, I had no idea there was so much uh, sort of like gun crime, I guess, back in the 1800s in London. Because, I mean, people aren't shooting guns for fun, right? It's, surely a lot of that is crime. So, yeah, I found that interesting, just the level of uh, gunshots that were happening. Um, one thing in terms of like if we want to talk about the crime and, and the guilt of um, Francis... I tried to look up, like, cause so so the victim's face, he was shot in the jaw and it had broken his jaw and then um, like lacerated his face, I think, basically. And I, I tried to look up about, um, his his face was covered in powder burn, so I tried to look up how, how far away you have to be for your face to still be covered in black powder. Um, but obviously, without knowing the the actual make of the revolver that he'd shot him with is it, it's impossible to really know I, I i couldn't even really find out much information ab- about that concept uh apparently like um a lot of black powder tests and stuff to see uh the effect of powder burn wasn't didn't really get carried out until like the late 70s so to actually know how far the black powder would have traveled is is quite difficult um it seems to me like like because the reason I say that is, is, is as someone who has no experience with firearms and you know I, I, I'm from the UK I, I've never been in the armed forces. I, to me, in my mind, I think black the idea of the black powder of traveling so far is is a bit of a stretch. Like I was always thought that you had to be quite close to get powder burn on something. Um, but I say with an old revolver, you assume that could have been further away, but I'm still not sure it could be that far away. And yet everyone seemed to talk and describe the scene as if Francis was quite away, uh, quite a long way away when he when he shot. Um, but I'm not sure he could have been that far away. Uh, but who knows? Um, you know, the fact that he sort of called out to him and he, he didn't reply, it seems like, you know, Tom's probably should have replied. <laughs> but, it, but, you know, he also, but, you know, Francis probably should have given him a bit more chance before he just decided to shoot. Um, But I think the interesting thing about when we talk about guilt and such, no one ever really talks about the the, the hysteria on the ground and how everyone was probably quite uh, wired and 
high strung at the time. You know, that, that, that doesn't really come into it back then. I don't, you know, obviously I don't think it really sort of uh, lets him off, but I think it does sort of perhaps show or help to show that he, he wasn't just there to just shoot and kill people for fun. Um, yeah, I think in the end his his uh, sentence was quite lenient, actually. So, so they sentenced him to death, but then basically pardoned him and said, like, spend a prison in year, which he served. I, I was quite surprised it was that lenient, actually, because at the end of the day, he still shot and killed someone, right? So, you know, whether or not he did that thinking it was a ghost or not, you, you, like, like I, 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 I'm sort of, I do tend to sort of feel, I sympathise maybe with both parties here. Like, I, I can see what the judge saying in, in when he says, basically, like, you know, you you went out with a load of gun with the idea that you were going to shoot this ghost. Like, that's probably not good in the, from the start. But then I can also kind of sympathise with Francis in that he probably just, you know, bricked himself. You know, you know, like he was obviously very scared uh, late at night in a dark rain, but then perhaps he shouldn't have been out there in the first place. But that's probably what a few drinks does to you because that's never mentioned in any of this. In the, in the trial, they never bring it up anything. But he was in the pub before he went there. Well, it says a lot, doesn't it? Chances are he was going to have at least one drink and likelihood is that it would have been a few more. So, you know, he probably gone out there, bold as brass, few drinks under his belt thinking yeah you know i'm gonna go catch this ghost and then when he was confronted with the ghost thought oh maybe not shot his gun ran away you know the whole story does lead yourself to think that he was probably quite drunk at the time and yet that's never brought up in the inquest or the trial or anything um but yeah you would assume that he was probably at least somewhat under the influence when he uh all of this carried out so anyway that's that story. It's an interesting story, I think. It, there's a lot more to talk about about it, I think, than you might first think. Because so the, the story is quite short. It's not. It doesn't have a great deal of detail, and you know, the, it's, it's quite straightforward, really. But it is an interesting one to discuss and talk about. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, thanks very much for listening. And as always, if you would like to contact me about this story or, or, or anything, uh, you can do. My email address is contact at darkhistories.com. Uh, you can see all the other ways you can contact me, like social media and stuff like that, in the show notes and on the website, which is darkhistories.com. You can also find links uh, in both of those places uh, for way, different ways that you can support if you would like to do so. And yeah, that's about that. Thank you so much uh, for listening, as always. It's always a, a great pleasure. So yeah, until next time, take care. Sleep tight.